Good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you this morning. Our life groups are getting started this week, and so would encourage you to sign up either for financial peace or the many, many other options that are in your catalogs. If you're thinking about that, we do life better in community. And so I really want to encourage you that. You can sign up on your connection card. You can sign up online. You can call the office. You can just show up, whatever it might be. But I really want to encourage you to step in and do that. It's great to be with you as we begin a new series here this morning called House Rules. House Rules. How many know that houses generally have rules? They're sometimes defined and other times they're not maybe defined, but there are house rules. One Scottsdale, Arizona mother uh, shares some of her house rules that she never thought she'd have to come up with, okay? But after having kids... You know, she came up with some house rules. Here was the first house rule she came up with. Underneath the couch is not a trash can, okay? That's the first house rule. How many of you have kids? You know exactly what we're talking about. When our kids were little, I mean, there were wrappers, there were toys, there were crayons, there were action figures, whatever it was. It was all shoved underneath the couch. The second house rule that she came up with was this. If you find it on the floor, you don't eat it, okay? Okay. <laughs> Right? Isn't that a good house rule? That's probably a good house rule right for here, too. If you find it on the floor, you don't eat it. And then this is one that we actually had in our house, but I, so I sympathize with this gal. This is the third house rule. No licking people, okay? <laughs> no licking people. Even if you think you're a dog or a cat, you know, you don't be licking people. That applies for here, too, by the way. Um, and the la another house rule she has, if you want to leave the house today, you must be wearing your underwear, okay? <laughs> you must be wearing your underwear. That was one of ours with our kids, you know, that you got those underwear on, you got those underwear on, okay. All right, and then here's the last one, here's the last one. I think this is a really good one. No taking your snack into the bathroom. No taking any snacks <laughs> into the bathroom. Yeah, you guys that have kids, you know what I'm talking about, right? You're like out there going like this with me, you know what I'm saying. So every home has what we call house rules. Uh, even here at the church, because we are a home, right? We're a home. This is the family of faith. This is God's house, uh, if you will. Last week, we, uh, we launched this whole theme of, of, of welcome home. And in Ephesians 2, uh, chapter uh, two verse, starting with verse 19, it says this, You're no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home country. I love that. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. Don't let anyone tell you different, by the way. God is building a home. Yeah, God is building a home. He's using us all irrespective of how we got here and what he is building. Amen? You belong here. God is building a home. He's using us. So, so welcome home. We need to grasp that God is building a home, and he's using us. He's using you. He's using me. This idea of home conveys uh, the sense of belonging, doesn't it? Of the sense of, of family and, and all of that. And so we begin to ask, I think, what are the house rules? If this is a home, what are the house rules? Because in a healthy home, there are always expectations for the, the family members, right? I mean, there's always certain expectations. There's expectations that every one will do their part. In other words, roll up their sleeves. It doesn't always happen, but there's, there's house rules. There's expectation. There's, there's expectation that everyone will contribute to the greater good. Not be tearing it down, but contributing to the greater good. There's, there's expectation that everyone will share common values and, and priorities. We may not agree with everything, but we have these things in common. There's expectations that they will all work to create a welcoming Home, And I ask you, is that what you're doing in your home and in this home, well, uh, creating an atmosphere that welcomes everyone? You see, house rules are established so that the home functions at its top level. Are you with me on that? 
The house rules are established so that the home is, is beautiful and, and it's welcoming. There's a good spirit behind everything. The house rules create an environment that welcomes and nurtures every single person. So today, we begin a new series called House Rules. And of course, we don't just come up with some rules, right? You know, that would be a great rule. You know, that kind of thing. We go to God's word, don't we? This is his house. So we go to God's word. We look to the Bible. We look to the life and teachings of Jesus to discover how he wants us to live. Now, after all, Jesus established the early church, didn't he? He established his church. He's the chief cornerstone of all of it. He's the foundation of the family of faith. So today, today we explore the house rule that states, this is the very first one, this is the house rule that states, we forgive. I want you to say it with me. We forgive. I want a little more gusto. We forgive. That's a house rule. We forgive. We find in Scripture that forgiveness is really important. It was major focus and topic of the entire Bible, especially the New Testament. Just consider, when Jesus was teaching us how to pray in Matthew chapter 6, Verse 12, he says this, and forgive us our trespasses just as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. In Matthew 6, 14, it says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Pretty straightforward. Mark eleven twenty five 25 says, but when you are praying, first forgive everyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Luke 6, verse 37 says, stop judging others and you will not be judged. Stop criticizing others or it will all come back on you. If you forgive others, you will be forgiven. Wow. The idea of forgiveness is important for all of us. We can all relate, I think, and recognize the need, whether it's the need to forgive or the need to be forgiven. Yet while we recognize that, I think, it's much easier said than done. How many would agree? We struggle with it. We struggle with it. We have questions about it. And that, by the way, is nothing new. This has always been the case within humanity's heart. We find in Scripture the story of a man named Peter. Many of you are familiar with Peter, part of that inner circle that Jesus had, who also had some questions about forgiveness. And we read the story in Matthew 18, starting with verse 21. And it says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Peter's thinking, man, I'm being really generous here, okay? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but, 70, but 77 times. Seven times, excuse me, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And so the idea is that it's unc- if we're counting, we're not forgiving, all right? And then Jesus goes on to share a parable, a story that would illustrate the spiritual truth that he just tells Peter. And so I'm going to read that to you. It says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the this, this settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. The idea is this huge number. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. 
At this, the servant fell, at, fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. So this, this drastic lesser amount, all right? He grabbed him and began to choke him, and he said, pay him back what you owe me. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Wow. Jesus tells this story to help, help us grasp the importance of forgiveness and mercy. And Jesus wants us not only to hear this truth, he wants us to apply it. Apply it to our lives. Live it out in our lives. Because unforgiveness can control and destroy our lives and the lives of those around us. You guys, let's be honest. Everyone has broken relationships. And in our pain and our, our woundedness, we can, we can build walls to keep ourselves from being hurt again. You guys relate to that? To rebuild relationships, we have to tear down those walls. We have to tear down those walls, and that begins with forgiveness. If we, if we listed, you and I, if we listed every hurt, every offense, you know, every, every hurtful word, every betrayal, every situation, our list would go on and on and on, wouldn't they? Because we've all been hurt, and we have all hurt others. If we really simplify this, we are all broken by sin. Meaning we do things our way. We do things our way instead of God's way. And in our humanity, we don't get everything right. Have you discovered that? We don't love unconditionally. It's always predicated on something, something we get right or they perform the right way. Then we love them. In Matthew 18, Jesus tells us this very I, I'm just going to say this way, this disturbing yet very profound story about forgiveness. And it's life-changing if you'll get a hold of it. Forgiveness is life-changing. And so we make it a house rule. We forgive. Within the story, we find two encouraging forgiveness principles. The first principle that Jesus shared is so simple. Let me encourage you with it. It's this. Because I have been forgiven, I can forgive. I want you to say it with me. Because I've been forgiven, I can forgive. The foundation for us to be able to forgive this huge catalog of hurts is because I've been forgiven, all right? And because we've been forgiven, we are then able to forgive. Picture this story again. Here's a servant who worked, who worked for a, a wealthy king, 
okay? He's just living his life, right? And, and all of a sudden, he gets, you know, the word that the, the king wants to see him. And, and so he comes in, and, and the king's going over his books. Uh-oh. He's going over his books and he discovered that this servant owes him a ton, okay? And the king says, pay now. If you don't, I'm going to put you and your family in jail until you can pay up. Just picture the story. And he says, please. Please, 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 you know, if you just give me time, I will pay you back. I'll, I'll pay back every single penny, you know, that, that I owe you. I, I'll pay it all back. And surprisingly, the king forgives the debt. He says, I'll wipe it off the books. I'll wipe it off the books. It's done. We're never going to talk about it again. You're free. I release you from this debt that you have. Now let's pause right the here and really think about this for a minute. This is really me. This is really you. Right? You and I owe a debt to the king. To God. That was an unpayable debt. It's a gigantic debt. It is compiled of everything you've ever done or not done or said or thought. It comes just by virtue of the fact that we are sinful and separated from God. And we owe him. We owe him a debt that is gigantic and we cannot pay it. Even like the servant who said, I just, you know, I'll, I'll just work and, and I'll, uh, you know, I'll work a little harder. I'll try a little harder and, and I'll pay it off. And we do that too. I'll, I'll try to be a little better. I'll, I'll try to get it right this time. And, and that's what he says. He could never have done it. And you and I can never do it. You and I, if we were to work as hard as we can, if we kept every commandment from now until the day we die, if we never said uh, another unkind word, if we gave everything we have to the poor, if we did everything nice we could think of, if we never had another grumpy day like that's going to happen, it would never be enough. We get pretty high and mighty about ourselves. The debt that we owe to the king is unpayable by us. We can't do it. We can never, ever, ever, ever pay it back. Why did the king in the story forgive the man? Why does God forgive me? Why does God forgive you? Why did he forgive you this debt that is so gigantic and that you could never possibly pay back? Why? Why does he do that? Why does he have mercy on us? Mercy means not getting what we deserve. Why does he do that? It's hard to believe. It's because of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm forgiven through Jesus. You're forgiven through Jesus. My debt wasn't unpaid. Somebody paid it with their very life. The debt that you owe God, it did not remain unpaid. That's why. You couldn't pay it. I couldn't pay it, but Jesus did. Because of what Jesus did in taking our debt that, that we owe, God had mercy on me. God had mercy on you. We are forgiven. In Luke 15, we read about an amazing God story. We, we have, you know, this amazing God, this Father who longs to forgive us. It's really a story that tells the same story that we were just 
we were just reading together, but different. You may be familiar with the story. It's a, it's a story called The Prodigal Son, or The Wayward Son. It's sometimes titled as well. And in this story is this, again, this wealthy man, interesting, who has two sons in this case. And, and one of them, the younger one, he comes to his dad, and he says, Dad, you, you know what? I'm sick of this. Basically, I'm paraphrasing, you know. I'm sick of this. I I don't want to live under your thumb anymore. I want to go out and do my own things. This is boring. This is lame. I want to go live my own life. And and by the way, I, I I want what's coming to me. I want my half of the inheritance. And it's interesting. The father doesn't say, what, you crazy, ungrateful little brat, you know. He doesn't say no way. The father, I can can imagine with tears in his eyes, though, handed the very rebellious son his inheritance. He says, you may go, your son. You may go, my son. Because here's the deal. God's not in control, into control. He's into leading. Satan's into control, by the way. You take that into your own home and how you treat people. That son went and lived his own way. You know the story, some of you? Got in trouble just about in every situation that he found himself. Lived this wild, lavish life. Ran out of money, ran out of friends, ran out of everything. And he finds himself in a pig pen. Literally, he takes a job feeding pigs. And he's, 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 he's laying in the pig pen, if you know the story, and he's realizing that, that he's thrown it all away. He's, he, he's given it all up. He, he comes to his senses, you know, there, and, and he says, I'm going to go back to my father's house. Stay with me. He doesn't anticipate for a minute now that, that his dad is going to be kind to him because he knows he doesn't deserve it. One thing that's going on right now is there's a lot of people who think they're entitled. And they deserve all this stuff. He knows he doesn't deserve it. In fact, he knows he deserves judgment. He deserves his father's anger. He deserves nothing because he's broken uh, all of dad's rules. He's broken dad's heart. So he thinks to himself, maybe, maybe I can go back to my dad and I'll, I'll just tell him, dad, you know, I, you don't have to treat me like a son. You can just treat me like a servant. I'll be your servant. I know I don't deserve anything. We learn that the son heads home, and the father is waiting, and he's watching for the son. In fact, he's looking for him to come home, and he, he gathers up his robe. They would have wore long you know, garments, and he gathers up his robe, which, by the way, was a humiliating act in that day. He gathers up his robe like a skirt, and he runs to his son to welcome him, and he hugs him, and he kisses him, and he puts a ring on his finger. All these things have significance, and he throws a party for him. In fact, Rembrandt uh, has painted this beautiful scene, and, and in this famous painting, Rembrandt Uh, You see the son coming back, you know, to the father. And if you look closely in the picture, you'll see that the father's hands really, really don't match. One of them is very masculine and, and, you know, tough, you know, kind of a man's 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 hands, you know. And and the other hand is more soft and feminine like a a woman's hand. So it it represents the the love of of God and, and the love of a parent, a father and a mother welcoming back their child. Their son who has gone away. And the father says to each one of us, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. When the child comes back, the son or the daughter comes back, the father doesn't demean him. Do you notice that? There's no recriminations. I told you so. I, I, I told you never to do that. How dare you even come back to me? Don't you know that you've broken my heart and my rules? Sometimes we think, I think, that when we have gone our own way, that God will somehow reject us, that he will somehow scold us. I'm not saying that we don't, that we don't live out some of those, those circumstances, that you know, the seed that we've sown comes back to us, but this passage tells us that, that 
that we have a father, a king, who sees the debt that we owe. He knows that we have messed up. Yet, when we return to him, he welcomes us home with open arms. He offers us forgiveness, the forgiveness that Jesus paid for, the debt that Jesus paid when he died on the cross for each and every one of us. When we accept his forgiveness and love, he calls us, doesn't he, his children, and welcomes us into his family. We read it in Ephesians. So if we think back to our text where Jesus tells the story of the king and the servant, we learn that if we are forgiven, we are to forgive, right? Right? I'm serious, right? I'm forgiven, so I forgive. Sounds so easy, so simple. Isn't that the way it is in our life? God forgives you and you forgive everybody else. Isn't that isn't it the way it is? No, there seems to be a problem. <laughs> Let's be honest. We don't like to forgive. Too often God forgives us, but we don't forgive others. And that's a dangerous pattern or response if we consider the rest of the story. I'm just going from the scriptures. Consider the rest of the story. Because here's the deal. The unforgiving in the story, the unforgiving become the unforgiven. The unforgiving become the unforgiven. Picture this story again. Back to the king and the servant. The servant receives what? Forgiveness from the king, right? He's happy. He's excited. The king has forgiven him. His debt's been paid. Uh, he's a happy man. It's a great day. He's, avoid, he's avoided prison and, and even more. He doesn't have to pay back the debt. He's heading home to tell his wife, man, I've got good news to tell her today. And on his way, he sees this guy who owes him 10 bucks. That's the disparity that's trying to be painted here. And he goes to this guy who owes him 10 bucks, and he grabs him, and he demands payment now. And the guy doesn't have the money on him. And so the servant who's been forgiven his debts gets tough with him. If you don't pay up, I'm going to have you and your wife and, and the kids thrown in prison. Now, you probably think that the servant is being terrible. Do you? I mean, I did. He's being terrible. He's ungrateful, right? But embarrassingly, if we admit the truth, when it comes to our sin, our failures, our weaknesses, we want God's, we, we, we want forgiveness from God. Oh, absolutely. We want forgiveness and lots of grace from family members and from friends and all that. We think they just need to understand. I mean, after all, we've been going through a tough time. Life hasn't been fair with us. After all, we're stressed. We're having a hard week. We want understanding. We want forgiveness. But when it comes to the weakness, the failures, the sins of others, our family, our friends, our coworkers, is it possible that we want to offer justice more than forgiveness? Is it possible that we want them to pay up or at least hurt a little bit? Is it possible that we're angry or hurt so we hold on to the hurt and the offense because we think it might hurt them? In our story, the king hears about this ungrateful servant, right? 
what he did. And so he calls the first servant back and he tells him, you evil, wicked man, I forgave you your debt, the debt you couldn't pay. I forgave you a debt that you could never ever pay. Why wouldn't you have mercy and forgive somebody else? So it says, he threw him into prison to be tormented. You know, in the message version, it says it this way, he put the screws to him. (laughs) That's kind of an interesting twist on it. There's definitely the idea here that he will be in prison and will be tormented or tortured. The idea is if you're not forgiving, never mind the reality of a real hell, the idea here is that you are creating a torture chamber for yourself when you aren't forgiving. You are going to build a wall around your heart that's going to hurt you and those around you. If you hold on to resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness, you will put yourself into an emotional prison. John Perkins says it this way, the saddest people I know are those who are unable to forgive. I remember once hearing that when we don't forgive, we are emotionally shackling our hearts and giving rent-free space in our minds to the unforgiven. If the seed of unforgiveness is left in your life, it will grow bitterness. It will grow resentment. It will grow anger and a host of other things that you don't want. It will eventually destroy your relationships, your friendships, your marriages, your relationships at church. It will isolate you. People will walk away from you because they don't want to be around it, except for a select few. It's time to forgive. It's time to release the offender. It's time to stop telling the story at nauseum. You have been forgiven a debt that you cannot repay. Whatever wound comes your way is not as grievous as the wound that God had against you. I understand that we think we're really pretty good. I do that. Oh, you know, I'm not as bad as that person. Most, you know, here haven't done some, you know, in their minds, some like, you know, that terrible, evil thing, you know. Um, But what we have is an unpayable debt to God. And it's been paid by Jesus with his own blood. And we all put him there. C.S. Lewis says it this way, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. If we want healthy lives, if we want healthy homes, if we want healthy churches, we need to personally apply this house rule. So how do we become forgivers? How do we let go of the layers of resentment and bitterness and anger that sometimes takes up residence in our souls? It's not easy. (laughs) But we can take two steps forward in becoming a forgiver. And I'm going to close with them. Here they are. The first is you surrender it to Jesus. You surrender it to Jesus. Take that wound, take that unforgiveness, take the bitterness, and you surrender it to Christ. You're not condoning it. You're just saying, I'm giving it to him. He died for my sins. He forgives me. Therefore, I will give it to him. I will let him be judge of the matter. I let it go. Because of his forgiveness for me, I can forgive them. In Matthew 18, the servant didn't get another chance. But we get another chance. Isn't that awesome? 
It doesn't really matter who it is you have not forgiven or, or what the grudge is that you're holding on to. That's really not the main thing. You have another chance today to actually begin to surrender it. This is your moment. And it has very little to do with your feelings. It has everything to do with action. Feelings will follow later when you take the right action. It could be that you're struggling Maybe you didn't even want to admit that you've been hurt. Maybe it's really, really difficult because someone has hurt someone you love. Parents can be great at this with their children. But Jesus speaks to our hearts today. He says, I've forgiven you. I've had mercy on you. I didn't give you what you deserved. I've loved you with an everlasting love. Now do the same. Jesus has welcomed us home. And he tells us that we have a place in his family. And he has established forgiveness as a house rule. Understand that an unforgiving Christian is an oxymoron. There is no such thing. Those who have been loved to the depths of their broken souls can love those in their lives who too are in desperate need of mercy and grace and forgiveness. We take that step today. We start that right now. We start by expressing our thanks to God for the forgiveness he has extended to us through Jesus. And then we recognize that because we are forgiven, we can forgive others. We're going to take a minute here and close out our service with a song of worship. And this is a time for us to contemplate. This is a time for us to think about who might it be that God brings to our mind or our heart or a situation. And I want to encourage you today, as God moves on us, as the Holy Spirit moves amongst us, to be, begin to think about that and begin releasing those things. I would encourage you to even take a piece of paper or out of your program or wherever it is and write maybe even that person's name down or that situation down and leave it here. Leave it on the altar. Fold it. Leave it on the altar. When you go out the doors, crumple it up and put it in the trash can. Let it go. And every time Satan brings it back to you, let it go. And every time Satan brings it back to you, let it go. And every time Satan brings it back to you, let it go. And do acts befitting of righteousness. Treat them the way Jesus treats you. Yes, it's possible they don't deserve to be forgiven. That's the point. They wouldn't need forgiveness if they've earned it. You guys, a counselor cannot release you of your bitterness. A host of pastors cannot release you of your resentment. Only Jesus can do that. By an act of your will, we're going to pray, right? And after we pray, we're going to have an opportunity to be prayed for on either side. My prayer partners, be ready, please. There's a place for you to come to the altar, however God might be speaking to you this morning. If you're not comfortable with that, you can, you can work on that right where you're at. Would you pray with me? Lord, it's an amazing story that we've looked into today that you told. And Lord, I'm just overwhelmed again by the fact of how gracious you've been to me, how merciful you've been to me, and how arrogant I can be to think for a moment not to extend the very thing that you've extended to me. Forgive me. And Lord, forgive all of us Because, Lord, I don't think I'm very different than those that are in this room and outside this room today. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord God, to value, truly value what you have done. And not to be just, give it intellectual assent and then somehow debate it with others. But, Lord, to actually live it in our lives. 
so that we can be a home that welcomes people, where people feel safe, where people can learn, where people can change by the power of your Holy Spirit. May we be people that are approachable. Lord, I just think about the fact that so many that were sinners, they flocked around you. You were a friend of sinners. Lord, do people feel that way and feel like they can come to us that way? Lord, help us to resemble that. Help us to be that in our own lives because we're full of mercy. We're full of grace. We're ready to help in people's time of need by your power. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Amen.